Um, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for uh, giving us a little time this evening. I was uh, asked very clearly um, to take the opportunity to come and talk to this uh, distinguished group of guests, which I was thrilled about, um, but there were several caveats. One was, um, you can use some PowerPoint, but no words. Thank you, Pascal. And the other was, um, talk about something different. Um, we know that Emirates has a great story. Uh, we're familiar with it, and we love to hear about it. But, but come talk about something different. So, so that was part of the um, the deal and the uh, the contract. And so the remit that was given to me was, come and talk about passion in the workplace, but give your personal perspectives, having worked in multiple businesses and multiple areas, around some of the opportunities and some of the upsides around building a passionate workforce. And so, when you think around passionate leadership. Um, there are many examples that we've all seen of, of truly passionate leaders. But passion isn't always visible. Um, there are different kinds of passionate leader. There is the kind of innovator and entrepreneurial passionate leader. So people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. Now, as you know, these are known to be guys that aren't, weren't that necessarily easy to work with. But nobody would question the fact that these are very passionate around innovation. And then there are people that are outwardly passionate and physically passionate. Um, people like Steve Ballmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, spring to mind. Steve would bounce onto stage and scream and get everybody excited in a frenzy to get them engaged and inspired. Um, and I've had personal exposure and experience to a leader like Jack Welsh at GE, whose physical presence and passion was truly overwhelming. Um, and so many different kinds. And then there's the true visionary, entrepreneurial, innovative passion that we see from amazing leaders such as uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. So very different connotations of what is passion. Now, as you reflect, you, know, you ask yourself the question, so if I build passion, does that mean I'll be successful? And the answer is no. Passion can be a major catalyst and a major contributor to driving success based on your definition of success, but passion alone will not guarantee success. And so the flow of the brief dialogue tonight is, how do you build passion but acknowledge what else matters to the workforce of today, but more importantly, to the workforce of tomorrow. And when I think around my own journey, and I remember my very first job, which was in the steel industry, um, the key driver for me when I thought around passion and engagement and igniting that was job security. I was of a generation where that's what mattered to me. So that's what I was looking for. And then when I elected to join GE around 15 years later, I wanted to be part of something bigger. And so values mattered to me, and job security to a much lesser extent. And when I made the decision last year to join Emirates Group, my motivation was around ability to drive change and make a difference. And so it's interesting to reflect how our own personal aspirations and motivations um, can change over time. And then when you consider Gen Y, Gen Z, as we know, they're wired very differently and want very different things and aren't necessarily looking for a career for life. Um, they're looking for experiences. They're looking to make a difference. And acknowledging that as we build a workforce is going to be really important. And so think around how we inspire people. People want purpose and meaning to what they do. It's not around simply coming to work and doing a job and getting a paycheck at the end of the month. It has to feel relevant and it has to feel like it matters. And we're also all wired very differently. We all have different motivators and <clears throat> we're all built in a way that you know, it's based on our upbringing and our education and our social beliefs and religious beliefs that make us all different. So harnessing the power of that diversity is incredibly important. And increasingly, we see employees who want a match in their DNA and organizational DNA. It has to fit together. And so thinking around happiness and the great work done by Dubai government in investing in engagement, contentment, and happiness, I think is a real testament to the future as we look towards building tomorrow's workforce and workplace. And values matter more than ever, an organization's values. And seeing some of the um, fantastic award winners this evening, and seeing some of the brands, both international and locally, I, I saw a common theme of companies that simply have great core values. And that's increasingly important to the workforce of tomorrow. And finally, having heart. You know, existing in the world, existing in the marketplace, doing good for the community. These are all things now that enhance the value proposition and can help to build passion in our workforce. And I share this really just as a couple of examples. If you look at the companies um, at the top left here, 
you'll recognize some of the brands. Kodak um, existed since 1888, you know, so it has been relevant for over 100 years. Yet in 2013, it was declared bankrupt. And not only were they declared bankrupt, they sold their IP and assets to companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, um, around digital. Now, without you know, doing a deep dive on this, one might ask, were they quick enough to react to changes in the market? And did they build passion and innovation in the workforce that enabled them to stay current? Blockbuster is another great example. You know, the video uh, store. I remember Blockbuster employing 60,000 people around 10 years ago. Today, they don't exist. And I think that's a great example to say is that a company that was so invested in video and CD that they didn't anticipate the market changes because they weren't investing enough in innovation and having that passionate workforce. Now, if you switch gears and look at some of the brands to the bottom left, there's a common theme. They're pretty new. And so the market today and the, employer, the employment market is no longer that respectful of, of longevity, of, of how long you've existed. A few years ago, none of us had heard of Alibaba, yet it concluded the biggest IPO in history, as we know. Um, look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn has 450 million members, as we heard. That's more than the entire population of the United States and Russia combined. So these numbers are simply staggering, and the pace of change is simply staggering, too. Um, Uber, the biggest taxi company in the world, doesn't own a single car. And so the game has changed, and normal rules don't apply, and the same applies in the employee marketplace, because the stakes are so high now that the employees are becoming increasingly selective and pushing us more and more to contemporize our employee offering if we're truly going to build passion in the workforce. The top right is a, a photograph I took last year. I was lucky enough to do some work with Disney. Disney, as you know, excel on having a passionate workforce and customer service. And so we went to the talk to them to understand why that is. And for those of you that have been to any of the Disney resorts, I'm sure, like me, you will reflect and say, that was a special experience. The people that I interacted with, regardless of age, regardless of background, they cared about whether I was having a good experience, every single one of them. That picture was taken after spending a morning with a janitor at Disney. His name is Christopher. So his core job was to keep a, a corner of Magic Kingdom clean and tidy. But when I asked Christopher what he does, he said, it's simple. I deliver happiness. I, I, I make good things happen for people. And so he was fully empowered, and he was required not only to, to do his day job of keeping the place clean, but to actually entertain people. And so that, that photograph that you see is what Christopher did, actually. He's trained in water art. So at a certain point in the day, he fills his bucket with water, takes his broom, and takes kids off and draws pictures of Disney characters for them. Now, they're also empowered to the extent that if they, for example, were to see an unhappy child, they can go into a store, take a, a toy off the shelf, give it to the child to make them happy. So this dance floor of empowerment is incredible and really helps to build this passionate workforce that creates a great differentiator in the market, but also makes it a great place to work for people. And then the bottom left, you've heard of Zappos. Zappos went from having zero revenue to over a billion dollars of revenue in less than 10 years. Um, this is their core value proposition for employees. The thing I love here is point number three, which says, we look for you to create fun and a little weirdness. Now, that's untraditional, that's non-conventional, but I think the more that we're focused on what are the things that matter today and tomorrow, now their value proposition is we will do whatever it takes to make you happy as a customer. Their longest telephone call with a customer ordering a pair of shoes was 10 and a half hours because the, the sales guy would not get off the phone until the customer was happy. So this kind of ethic around bringing that persona, that personal connection, can truly, truly drive business results. But the other interesting thing that you see more and more is point 10, which is be humble. So finding this entrepreneurial spirit, this inventiveness, um, but in a way that, that drives a confidence, but a humility is so important. I share on the left, uh, just personal reflections. I was really lucky a couple of years ago um, with a former employer to be selected with a group of senior executives, and we were sent to Africa for three weeks. Um, it was a very expensive trip. We didn't quite understand why, and for three weeks, we got to do some cool things. We did some business projects, but it wasn't about that. We actually spent time in local villages. Um, we did some cool things at schools. We painted schools. We rebuilt schools. And I'm talking about business CEOs, business CFOs, um, and the experience for us personally, was literally life-changing. Because we bonded as a team, but not only that, to feel that we were able to do something good in the world whilst being paid by the company 
whilst being funded by the company, and then wanting us to do it to make us better people was truly touching and, and a great connection for us back to the company that said, not only are we proud of what we did, we are so proud to work for this organization because you do stuff like this. And then interestingly, the other thing that I've reflected on my own personal journey of growth is, um, as I look towards you know, youngsters and the new generation for whom work life and personal life really do morph into one, whether it's social media or intimacy, even for somebody like me, that's my case. I mean, yes, I work in HR for a, for a great company, um, but that's not who I am. I'm actually a husband and a father and a son and a brother. And in my life, that's just as important to me as the work stuff. And so when I go to work, I take all of that noise with me. And I'm proud of it. And, and I see that increasingly so, that the degree of transparency, the degree of openness in life is changing. And, and so harnessing that informality is so, so important. So question for you. If you look at the black and white pictures on the right, does anybody know who the chap with number 41 is? Did I hear Bannister? OK, number 41 is Roger Bannister. This is a story about belief, back to my theory that passion alone will not drive success. Um, if you look at the bottom, these are two guys you probably haven't heard of. To the right is a guy called Gunder Haag. To the left is a guy called Arnie Anderson both of whom were fanatics around trying to crack the four-minute mile, both Swedes. And this was taken in around 1942, where Gunder Hagen, number one, set the world record. And he came in four minutes and six seconds. And so these guys continued to push each other constantly, constantly. Later that year, um, Anderson took the record with four minute five. The next year, Haag took it back four minute four. And so this continued and continued. And in 1945, Haag set the uh, new world record at four minutes and one second. That record lasted for nine years. So having changed hands so many times, it got to a point where the general world said, you know, maybe this is it. In the meantime, the guy to the top right, who you also won't have heard of, is an Australian by the name of John Landy. John was also a fierce competitor, and like everybody else, was aspiring to get this title of the world's fastest mile. And John, <coughs> that year, hit several times, four minutes and two, four minutes and two, four minutes and two. Now, interestingly, the guy number 41, Roger Bannister, on the 6th of May, 1954, went to work. He was a doctor, um, did half a day's work, then traveled to Ifley in Oxfordshire, where there were around 3,000 people. The weather was really bad, it was wet and it was windy, and so conditions were not right. But he knew that Landy was on his way to Finland to take a crack at the title. For a moment in time, the, the wind dropped, and Bannister said, I'm going to do it. And Roger Bannister was the first guy in history to complete the four-minute mile in less than four minutes. He did it 3.59.4 seconds. Incredible. Just to give you a feel for what a big deal this was, you know, the world had just come out of the Second World War, depression, poverty. People wanted a feel-good factor. And what was interesting here, in the presidential debate that's gone on over the last two weeks with Trump and Clinton, I think they've averaged about 88 million viewers. This thing had 100 million listeners on radio. That was the level of interest in cracking the four-minute mile. So here was the fun fact around it. Bannister had actually been to the Olympics in 1948 and 1952. Came away with nothing, <laughs> right? So he acknowledged he wasn't necessarily the best athlete in the world. But what he had was belief. And he visualized constantly crossing that finish line in under four minutes. So having lasted for nine years, Bannister's world record lasted 46 days. Because John Landy beat him by a second. Because Landy then said, geez, if he can do it, I can do it. Because all the medical reports have suggested that the human body cannot run a mile in under four minutes. It's physically impossible. They don't have the lung capacity. It can't happen. And Landy had said, look, all that time, I'd let these thoughts drive down to my feet, and I couldn't crack four minutes too. But the minute the British guy did it, I knew it could be done, and I beat him next time out. And so the, the, the kind of point with this story is Landy was probably the best athlete all along, but Bannister went down in history because he believed in what he was doing, he believed in his own capability, and had passion and commitment to make that happen. And so I think it's a great story, back to my opening line of having passion won't necessarily, you know, 
guarantee you success. Having passion, capability, and belief will really increase your chances. And so for us, as leaders, as human resource professionals, to invest in building passion and engagement is really important. But to do that, we have to be prepared to sometimes change our employee value proposition and get with the times, especially with the focus on youth and listening. And so in closing, um, and before we um, head out to dinner, um, I wanted to share with you this stroke of genius that I came up with last night, which is results. And, and results don't mean profit. Results can mean break even. They can mean losing less money. Um, can be determined by capability, multiplied by passion and belief and values and diversity, divided by innovation, times potential, multiplied by culture. And so if we can figure this out, guys, I think we've got a winner. And, and it's kind of humorous, but the point is, we have to work on all of these things. You've seen examples of companies that cease to exist by not adapting, by not being agile. And I think for us, as professionals, recognizing that we have to differentiate, you know, we have to collaborate to make ourselves better is truly what will make us game-changing. And, you know, looking again at some of the organizations that, you know, got great awards tonight, I think that's great testament to how we're thinking about this stuff. But I can't emphasize enough the need for speed in terms of how we react to some of these uh, challenges. So, that's passion. I'd like to thank you for your time.